It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. You can find me at Opperman Investigations and Digital Forensic Consulting uh, through my website, emailrevealer.com. Or you can just contact me directly at oppermaninvestigations at gmail.com. I'm really excited about our guest today. He's a former homicide inspector from San Francisco, Frank Falzon, F-A-L-Z-O-N. And you can find him at frankfalzon.com. And if you go to frankfalzon.com, you get an autographed copy of his book. Uh, the book is called San Francisco Homicide Inspector, 5 Henry 7. That was like his code name. Uh, my Inside Story of the Night Stalker. City Hall Murders, which is the Dan White case, uh, zebra killings, Chinatown gang wars, and a city under siege. This is all the hot stuff that went on in San Francisco back in those days. If you want to meet him in person, February 8th uh, in San Francisco at the, um, Frank, what's that called, that club? The Commonwealth Club. Commonwealth Club. I can't read my own handwriting. Uh, and it's going to be at 5.30 p.m. He's going to do a PowerPoint presentation. So Frank Falzone, are you there? Yes, I am, Ed, and I want to thank you uh, very much for having me on your show today. No, I'm very excited. This is even, my audience loves these topics. And uh, before we get into your book, San Francisco Homicide Inspector 5 Henry 7, uh, tell us about yourself. Who is Frank Falzon? Uh, I was a San Francisco homicide inspector for 22 years of my 28-year career. Uh, during that period of time, I handled over 300 murder cases. And those murder cases uh, ran the gauntlet of just about everything any person could imagine. Uh, in fact, I, one of the things that just remains with me to this day is I had three capital murder cases all going at the same time in three different courtrooms on the third floor at the Hall of Justice. Uh, for a police homicide inspector to have one capital murder case is considered a career. I had three all at the same time. So I, I either was unlucky or lucky, depending on how you want to look at it. I had a very colorful career. Yeah, I'll say, and I don't even think we can cover all this in one show. Uh, there's so many uh, such hot topics. Uh, which, what would you like to start with first? Uh, the Night Stalker, the Dan White case? Uh, um, what would you like to start with? Well, I, I think most people find... Uh, the Night Stalker case, the most interesting. This was probably uh, one of the most uh, and biggest manhunts in the history of the state of California. Uh, Richard Ramirez ended up being identified as the Night Stalker based upon the work of my partner, Carl Klotz, and myself. Um, we identified him, and within 24 hours of that identification, he was captured in L.A., uh, having just gotten off a, a bus from El Paso, Texas, and he was being uh, chased through the L.A. area by citizens. Uh, but the Night Stalker case would probably be a good place to start, Ed. Yeah, previously I had on that Detective Gil Carrillo um, on the show talking about the Night Stalker case. So how did you get involved? Well, L.A., uh, Solano and Carrillo were the two... Um, I guess task force people uh, representing the L.A. area. And then there was uh, Paul Tippin and Leroy Orozco from the LAPD, and they had set up a task force, and they had, uh, I believe, up to 15 murder cases, all involving this so-called walk-in killer, uh, the Valley Intruder. But it wasn't until a murder in San Francisco, out by the San Francisco Zoo, uh, on Eucalyptus Avenue, where a man and woman were shot in the head in their bedroom just before midnight, and then the assailant uh, raped the semi-conscious woman, uh, went into her kitchen, uh, ate their food from that night's dinner, uh, regurgitated the food onto the floor, uh, went into the uh, living room area, and with a sharp object, probably a knife, etched in the wall uh, a satanic symbol of a pentagram. And just below that symbol, it was obvious he pleasured himself uh, 
praying to Satan, uh, leaving a puddle of semen on that living room floor. This was about as sick and as demented of a crime scene I'd ever seen. So that got us involved in our case, and thanks to a uh, Glendale police sergeant by the name of uh, John Perkins, uh, he had a case also involving this walk-in killer, and he started calling up and down the coast because he had heard about our San Francisco case from one of his uniformed policemen. Eventually, he touched San Francisco with my partner, Carl Klotz, and when they started talking, the, the mentioning of um, 22 caliber slugs with a pink primer on the uh, casings uh, triggered a very positive response from my partner. Immediately, uh, we were linked to the L.A. cases. It was at that point in time with the L.A. media, the San Francisco media, he became known as the Night Stalker, working the state of California. It put the entire state on alert. It had family after family living in fear, locking doors and shutting windows, uh, locking them. And it just happened to be one of the hottest times in the history of the Bay Area and Los Angeles. So all this took place. We flew down to L.A. to find out as much as we could about their 15 cases. When we left that L.A. area, the only thing we came back with, besides a lot of uh, information on uh, similar comparison to our case, was the fact that they had identified the, this valley intruder having a first name, Rick. With that information, I pulled all the reports I could of recent burglaries in San Francisco. And as luck would have it, I, I hit upon a burglary out in our marina district, very high-end part of San Francisco. Uh, the doctor, he was a dentist by the name of uh, Soroyan, uh, lived out on Baker Street. Um, he had gone out with his wife, and he left his niece and her girlfriend at home, uh, two young ladies. Fortunately, they went to bed early that night downstairs in the house when the intruder climbed through the bathroom window. They, he never found them, and they never heard him. He ransacked the upstairs of the house, throwing a bunch of valuable pieces into a pillowcase, and we believe for a fact that he was looking outside the window because the drapes had been pulled apart when Mr. and Mrs. Soroyan returned home somewhere around 10, 10.30 that night. As they came up through the garage and the inside staircase, he was going out the front door and down the staircase. So those people in that house don't know how close mm -hmm. they came to being part of this terrible spree of murders. Uh, what we found out was one of the items taken in that burglary, and again, and very ironic, my son, a young police officer, made that report. He listed every item in detail, and one of the items was a, a woman's bracelet. And a burglar's worst nightmare was that Dr. Soroyan had etched his driver's license number on the inside of that bracelet. And that item turned up stolen, and it was found down in Lompoc, California, an area in between San Francisco and L.A. I immediately called down to the Lompoc Police Department, talked to a sergeant, Harry Hyde, and I told him I had to know his informant that that bracelet, I believe, is linked to this serial murder known as the Night Stalker. Sergeant Harry Hyde, uh, uh, he was very, uh, I guess you would say, emphatic that he wasn't about to give up his informant. And I remember because I think everybody in the homicide detail thought I was losing it. My voice got very demanding, very loud. And I said, Sergeant, I want to make myself perfectly clear. Somebody dies this weekend, and I could prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you withheld evidence and information that could have prevented that murder 
I will come to Lompoc myself and put you in handcuffs. All of a sudden, his demeanor, my demeanor changed. He said, please, Inspector, calm down. I will call my informant. If he wants to talk to you, he'll be calling you back shortly. Well, I no sooner hung up, and my partner and other guys in the unit are trying to calm me down. The phone rings, and lo and behold, it's this guy, Earl Gregg. Earl Gregg tells me he had the bracelet. He gave it to Sergeant Harry Hyde. How could he help me? That's the informant. I said, I'm sorry? That was the informant? Yes. And I said, Earl, I need to know where you received this bracelet, who you received it from, and that person's information so I can talk to them. Well, he he wasn't holding anything back. He said, I got it from my mother-in-law, Donna Myers. She lives in San Pablo. He provided me the address and her phone number. My partner, myself, and I grabbed uh, one of my uh, fellow investigators, uh, Mike Mullane. I said, this thing's going to blow up today. Please join us. So the three of us headed over to San Pablo, but we stopped in to see the San Pablo chief of police. Protocol dictates you let the chief know you're going to be working in his area and see if he has a man that wants to work with you. Uh, I was very fortunate. The chief in uh, San Pablo gave me his uh, top detective, uh, George Spencer, and and now the four of us head over to uh, Donna Myers. Talking to Donna Myers, oh, my God, every question I asked, she's, uh, she's hitting a home run. Hmm. He, this suspect, she says, wears an ACDC black hat. He wears a, a members-only jacket. He's a, a Mexican male. He worships Satan. Uh, he's a known burglar, has all kinds of stolen objects. Uh, everything she's saying is ringing true. So I said, Donna, I have to know, how did you come up with the bracelet? She says, my boyfriend. Now, mind you, this woman's 52. Her boyfriend's 26. Wow. She says her boyfriend lives in El Sobrante, which is a sister city to San Pablo. They're attached to each other. So he was only minutes away. So I left Mike Mullane, the other San Francisco inspector, with Donna Myers, uh, George Spencer from San Pablo, and my partner Carl Klotz and I head over to El Sobrante. We pull up in front of the residence where the boyfriend lived, a man named Armando Rodriguez, and it's a, a gated area. The gate's about 12 feet tall, and the house is set back up on a hill. I look across the street, and I see the El Sobrante Fire Department. So we walk across the street. The firemen are very uh, willing to help us. I use their telephone. I put a call into the house, and I said, Armando, I need to talk to you. Frank Falzon, San Francisco Homicide, I have very, very important information for you that you need to hear. He said, well, tell me. I said, no, I have to tell you in person. I'll meet you down at the gate. So now the three of us walk across the street. We're standing down in front of the gate. Here comes this man who we would later find out is Armando Rodriguez coming down this long driveway, and he's got two growling Doberman pinchers on leash on leashes. He he comes to the gate, and I said, "Look, Armando, the information I have is so vitally important. I know I left in his mind. I might have had information regarding a family member passing away. I never said that, but that's the impression I left. And I said, I'm not going to stand here and talk to you behind a locked gate." with two dogs growling at me. I said, come out from behind the gate. I said, if you don't want to talk to me, fine. We can go back to San Francisco. I turned around and started to walk towards the San Pablo uh, plainclothes car. And next time I turn around, the dog's on the other side of the gate, and he has stepped out. And he says, what is it you want, man? What is it you want? And I said, Armando, we have information your friend Rick is the Night Stalker. All we need from you 
is Rick's last name. Well, I got a barrage of every MF word you could think of and every swear word I think I've ever heard, how I was so wrong, and I'm looking at him, and I'm saying, I'm, hey, I could be wrong, but it's my job to investigate. Your friend Rick is innocent. We'll clear him. He said, let me tell you, Inspector, when my friend Rick is in L.A., murders are happening in San Francisco. When he's in San Francisco, murders are happening in L.A. I know He's not the night stalker. Well, I said, it's not up to you. I need your help. And that's when I got another barrage. And my partner intuitively opened the back door of the San Pablo police car. I patted down Armando. I placed him in the back seat. Uh, San Pablo detective went behind the steering wheel. My partner got into the back seat next to Armando. I'm now sitting in the passenger seat in the front, and I'm leaning over in the back, and I'm pleading with him, telling him about how people are being... Uh, this Satan killer is killing people sadistically, ripping out eyeballs. Everything ugly and demeaning he can do, he does. Yeah, I need your help. Please help me. And then I got another barrage of the MF word, and other words, and he said, look, man, you had no right to put your hands on me. Who the F do you think you are? Are you some sort of tough guy? And he looked down at my hand on the seat, and for some reason my hand was shut. And next thing, his fist flew up in the air. And he says, oh, you want to fight me? And he uses the MF word again. And I learned a long time ago I'm not about going to take the first punch. Somebody puts their hands up, my fists are flying, and I punched him right in the eye. He fell over on top of my partner, Carl. Carl sat him back up, and he had a small cut, maybe about half an inch under his left eye. And he dabs it with his two fingers, sees the blood, and now he's really tearing into me with every verbal uh, bad word he could think of. Look what you've done to me, you tough SOB. I said, no, I'm not tough. But he says, uh, is that as hard as you can hit? And I said, no, his fists are still up. I said, I'm, gonna, I'm about going to show you how hard I can hit. I'm going to split you from the top of your head, pretty boy, all the way down to your behind. And to straight out honesty, I don't know if I was going to hit him or not. I had never done anything like this. In, in my whole police career, over 300 murder cases, thousands of interrogations, I've never used my hands. And here I was. I was going to blast him again. And I start over the seat, and Armando Rodriguez falls back, folds his arms, and he screams, Richard Ramirez, man, Richard Ramirez. Mm. I collapsed in the front seat. I looked at San Pablo detective George Spencer. I said, George, please drive us to the Hall of Justice in San Francisco. Those two words, Richard Ramirez, not only broke our Mr. and Mrs. Peter Pan case, double murder out in San Francisco, but we broke the 15 cases down in Los Angeles, and we would learn that we'd have three more cases in San Francisco that would be cleared. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, Rick, but uh, I mean, Frank, uh, like at first, when you first heard that name Ramirez, I, I know when I'm looking for somebody and the name is Ramirez or Peterson, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's, you know, it's such a t common name, you know what I mean? Like, you didn't say, oh, man, couldn't it be something more unique? Well, what we come to find out, your question is very well taken, uh, Ed. Uh, what we found out when we got back to the Hall of Justice, there was six oh. in the criminal justice system within the, the state of California. Uh, Richard Ramirez, <clears throat> six of them. So it became imperative that we pull those six pictures. And with Armando Rodriguez, he made a positive identification. We eventually gave Armando Rodriguez immunity to testify in all the cases down in L.A. He became a key witness. And I remember when it was all said and done, that man who had a complete hatred for me was calling me every name in the book, came up to me after it was all over. And he said, Inspector, I want to thank you. 
you changed my life. And you changed my life for the better. I never was involved in anything serious. I was a fence. I sold all this stolen property for money, and I got a percentage. He says, but you've changed my life. I'm going back to college, and I'm going to become a physical therapist. That's the last time I talked to Armando. Mm -hmm. So he had a complete change of heart, and I'm very happy for that. A couple, couple of quick questions for you now. Okay, you got the name Richard Ramirez. You got a picture of him, but he's such a transient. Uh, did you get a good address right away? I'm sorry, I missed that question, Ed. Yeah, I'm saying that uh, you were able to get his name and identify his face, but he's such a transient. Were you able to get a good address right away? Well, you're excellent, Ed. That's another <laughs> power, powerful question because what happens next, and and this is very very important. Uh, the two L.A. Sheriff's detectives, they didn't want to share anything. So my chief sets up a three-way conversation for 7.30 that Thursday night. And in that three-way conversation was Sheriff Block, his two detectives, Carrillo and Solano, uh, Police Chief Daryl Gay, his two detectives, Leroy Orozco and Paul Tippin. My chief of police, Con Murphy, my partner, Carl Klotz, and myself, we're all on this three-way conversation. And the first one to speak was Sheriff Block. And his demand was to my chief, I want your men to stand down until our men, uh, Carrillo and Solano, can build up their cases. And my chief covered up the phone. He looked at me and said, what's your thought, Frank? I said, uh, Chief, no way are we standing down. I said, everybody in the San Francisco Hall of Justice knows we have a warrant for arrest in the Peter Pan and Barbara Pan murder case, and we stand down and somebody's murdered this weekend. How's that going to play out in the press? And my chief raised his eyebrows, and he says, powerful. He, go he repeats exactly what I said to Sheriff, uh, Sheriff Brock, Block and also to Chief Gates, and God bless Chief Gates. He chimes in. I believe I, I support the position of Con Murphy and his two detectives. Tonight at 10 o'clock, we're all going to go on the news, and we're going to put that picture in the front of every newspaper in the state, and we're going to go on live TV and radio, and we're going to have a manhunt, and everybody will know who we're looking for. That came from Daryl Gates, and that's exactly what we did 10 o'clock that night, at, at Thursday. By Saturday morning, Richard Ramirez was in custody. Let me ask you a question. What, what do you think of that? What was it, a Netflix documentary that just came out recently? Um, what did you, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, you, you know, I, I had kept my mouth shut because I didn't want to jeopardize the L.A. cases that where they sustained a conviction. So I, I stood down. But now Richard Ramirez has died. So when Netflix called me, I, I, I was pretty firm with them that I didn't want to touch this thing because of the way the narrative was played by the L.A. Sheriff's Department, that it just wasn't, in my opinion, truthful. Gotcha. And Net, Netflix says, it, look, we're willing to pay you substantially to tell your side of the story. Once they offered me that, that was the first time I let my story be told uh, to the populace of, uh, of our country. Uh, and Netflix uh, was an award-winning show uh, with the third uh, chapter of that show that was four-part series. Uh, it was all about myself and how the case was broken, pretty much identical to what I shared with you and your audience today. Did, did you notice uh, Netflix attempting to play down the Satanism aspect? Well, if they did, I didn't pay attention because it seemed like every one of his murders. And, the re and then and I found out the real reason. The real reason was uh, normal people, church-going people. They pray to God, pray to God for all reasons, protection, uh, health, you name it. Well, his belief was just the opposite. He had been a Catholic. He had been an altar boy or at least involved with the church. And all of a sudden, everything changed. And once he adopted the devil, everything ugly, horrible, demented, uh, 
out of the ordinary uh, became important to him because the devil was protecting him. When we found the uh, Tenderloin uh, apartment he was living in, over his bed, multiple satanic symbols, the pentagram with the star and the circle. Everything was dedicated. He had the star and the circle on his hand, the palm of his hand, and he kept it there even during the time when he was in prison. The devil was offering him protection in his sick mind. Do you think he had any accomplices or or, or, or a larger group helping him? If he did, uh, we never found out, and I don't believe any of the L.A. uh, task force found out. It seemed like he was a loner, and the more he was high on cocaine, the more he would it would support his devil worshiping and if he was in your house and it became important to kill for either sexual pleasure or whatever he would do it and then offer up sacrifice to the devil and the stolen property was all being housed at Armando's a residence in El Sobrante we obtained a search warrant and came up with the stolen property from the pan murder case in San Francisco and pretty much all of the murder cases in L.A. Now, now, what do you think about Armando? Like, he had to know, hey, I just got this loot, and there was just a, a murder by the Night Stalker just the same night. You know, what, what do you think he knew more than he let on? Yeah, I would agree with you. He had to know. But our narrative at that time was we wanted him to tell the truth yeah. and to testify against his friend and to push him uh, and make him a, a part of that conspiracy would have weakened our evidence in the trial uh, for the death penalty uh, and the cases in L.A. We never did try him in San Francisco, but when he came up to the Bay Area to go over to San Quentin, our district attorney had us pull him in, into the city and county of San Francisco jail. So I met him firsthand, and we booked him in on Uh, five murder cases uh, in San Francisco. And actually, I should say three murder cases. And as he was walking away, he turned around, he hollered, hey, Falzon. And I didn't even know he knew my name. And I turned around, I looked at him, and he's got that smiling grin on his face. He's got his palm raised up, fingers folded, showing me the pentagram. He said, I bet you want to know about those two old ladies up on Telegraph Hill. And I looked at him, and I was kind of puzzled because I had no idea what he was talking about. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, you know, the two old ladies, Telegraph Hill, you know. And of course I knew because it was my case. Six months previous, two old ladies living alone, they were burglarized, brutally murdered. One of them tried to get to the window and scream out for help and her neck was sliced from one end to the other. Brutal, brutal murder case. Well, he pretty much confessed right there, because as he walked away, he laughed and said, I did those, pals on, I did those. So, yeah, he, he's a, a real sick individual. Do you think there were any more that uh, he didn't confess to that he's responsible for? Uh, we, we researched everything in San Francisco, and I know for a fact the LAPD and the LASO, they had set up a task force that was very impressive, running down all the the leads on those 15 murder cases. Uh, Now, the two agencies, I found, were not sharing information with each other. There was competition. I got it. So I was gleaming everything I could from both agencies. And like I said, when I left there, my partner and I were satisfied. The biggest piece of evidence we had was that first name, Rick. Now, uh, you hear these stories on the Internet and these podcasts and stuff like that, um, that uh, he had a cousin or a relative that had just come back from Vietnam. What can you tell us about that? You know, I can't really uh, elaborate much more than what I saw on television mm-hmm. and what I've read in the, on the Internet. Uh, apparently, he had a, a very sick individual cousin that uh, came back from Vietnam, and he was an older cousin and uh, shot and killed, I believe, his wife in front of Richard Ramirez. And 
that led to his demented ways. I have no verification whether that is true or not. What do you think is the public's biggest misconception about the Night Stalker case? I think the biggest misconception is that the case was broke by the L.A. Sheriff's Department. Uh, They ran with it because they had the body. Uh, They shut us down by saying uh, San Francisco hurt our case because their mayor, Dianne Feinstein, went on the radio and talked about the shoes and about the the bullets, and they got tossed into the bay uh, uh, from the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, So they would water my partner and I down pretty much 100%. And my partner and I, we sure in the heck weren't going to say anything. Uh, It was more important to get the conviction. Uh, But now that it's all said and done, uh, my partner has passed away. And for my own sake and for my partner's sake, I, I think the public deserves to know the truth. Yeah, so do I. Um, you know, it's funny you mentioned Feinstein getting on TV. Uh, one of your other cases, the Dan White, uh, uh, Harvey Milk case at the mayor's office down there in the uh, government building. I have a friend who was a former court officer, and there's courts in that building over there too. So he always goes off on Diane Feinstein going on the news and spilling her guts about that case as it was going on. Uh, so as soon as you mentioned her uh, talking about these shoes, it came right to my, my memory. We're talking to Frank uh, Falzon. Real quick, uh, Frank Falzon, the book is called, again, uh, it covers way more than just uh, uh, this Night Stalker case. San Francisco Homicide Inspector 5 Henry 7, My Inside Story of the Night Stalker, City Hall Murders, Zebra Killings, Chinatown gang wars and a city under siege. I'm sorry I interrupted you. What were you going to say? Uh, I was going to say regarding the city hall murders, uh, that's a case that uh, gripped the city. Uh, It's a case that made Dianne Feinstein. uh, She had uh, lost the uh, Board of Supervisors. I'm sorry, the mayor's race. Uh, She was president of the Board of Supervisors, and she had swore off anything further uh, for her political career. And when the murders went down, uh, Mayor Moscone being shot and killed and uh, Supervisor Harvey Melk, as the president of the Board of Supervisors, she was immediate, immediately elevated to the position of mayor of San Francisco. And personally, I liked Diane Feinstein. She was a middle-of-the-road moderate Democrat. And she held the city together during probably one of the most chaotic times ever. Uh, the, the White Knight riots, uh, uh, you, you have to see the film to believe it. Uh, it, was, it was unreal. Uh, the decision by the, the jurors uh, left uh, the whole city of San Francisco upside down. Well, also, too, wasn't that the same week or, or the same weekend as the, uh, the, the Guyana, uh, Jim Jones uh, suicides? Well, the day we got the call of a shooting at City Hall, my partner at that time uh, was Inspector Herman Clark, and we're heading up to City Hall, and I'm thinking in my head, I know who did this. If the mayor's been shot, it's it's one of the disciples of Jim Jones, right. because 10 days earlier, 400 people drank the Kool-Aid and sacrificed their lives. Others were killed as they try to flee Guyana uh, by disciples of uh, Jim Jones. And the word came out was some of those disciples survived. They were coming to San Francisco to kill City Hall politicians, uh, trying to fulfill wishes of Jim Jones, their a reverend who was to them their god. Um, yeah, it, I was 100% certain, never did I expect when I got to the top of the stairs at City Hall and I was met by the mayor's bodyguard, Jim Molinari, and he says, Frank, the mayor's dead. Hearing those words, uh, it was just devastating. And I looked at him, I said, Jim, do we have any idea who did it? And he looked at me, he says, "Uh, Dan White. And Dan White had been a supervisor. He had been one of my best friends. I considered him a kid brother. We had played softball together. He worked Northern Station with me. I was invited to his son's baptism. Dan White went to the same grammar school as me, 
played in the same ballparks. Dan White couldn't be Dan White. I knew that for a fact. He was too straight of a guy. He was the All-American boy. He had just resigned his position as a supervisor. And I, I was fine with that. I felt he was a great fireman, terrific police officer, fought for his country uh, in the Air Force. This, this guy was everything I thought a man should be. And now I'm hearing he's a killer? This, this, this just blew me away. And as I'm thinking about it, I, I, I can't put it all together. But eventually I have to alert everybody to look for Dan White. He's wanted for the mayor of George Moscone. And I would come to find out across the hall he also shot and killed Harvey Milk. Well, eventually, he ends up in the homicide detail. They're holding him for me to return. I open the door. I see Dan White, three-piece suit. His face is flushed, and he looks at me. And I think any other man going in there, he would not have made a statement. I looked at him, and it just came out of me. I said, Dan, how could you be so stupid? What the hell were you thinking of? And he stood up and he looked at me and his face became even more red. And it looked like a pressure cooker with its lid about to blow off. And then it did blow off. Tears started streaming down his face. He says, Frank, I want to tell you everything. He started crying hysterically. I said, stop. I said, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right. I walked to my desk. I got a fresh cassette. I locked up my gun in the desk drawer, took my recorder. I hollered over to one of my old partners, Ed Erlatz. I said, Ed, would you sit in with me? Help me on this statement with Dan White. Ed came in with me, and we now took the infamous Dan White confession. And it, sure, it was a self-serving statement, but I had zero clue as to what was going on up at City Hall. As far as police are concerned, we don't like politics. We're hired to do something very simple, protect and serve. And that's what we do. City Hall politics, it's always a mess up there. Either they don't have enough money, they're hiring for different reasons, uh, got homeless problems, we got all kinds of drug problems. So uh, we don't get involved. But now I'm right in this middle of this turmoil Dan White's confession, I, I was criticized because I allowed him to do a narrative. Well, my thinking was, narrative is the only way I'm going to find out why this happened. And during that narrative, he confesses to the two murders of George Moscone and Harvey Milk. Outside, I knew, because other inspectors had warned me, the public defender was in the office saying, I'm here to represent Dan White. I did not stop my interrogation because Dan White did not ask for the public defender. He was there volunteering. So when I finished the tape recording, I opened the door, and Dan's wife had brought in Jim Purcell, a private attorney who shut down everything. He advised Dan not to make any further remarks. Dan White was booked in two counts of murder at city prison that day, that night, Sadly, Mary Ann White, probably one of the finest women I've ever known, along with Gina Moscone, uh, George Moscone's widow, all these women cared about was their children. They weren't involved in the messy city hall politics. I had to go to Mary Ann's house that night. This woman's day was as ugly, if not uglier, than the day I had put in. And I was there now to search her house with a search warrant. Now that day will live with me for the rest of my life. Yeah, my God, I cannot imagine. I cannot imagine. Um, you've had some life, and I told you before we started, I knew you were a great storyteller, but I told you, <laughs> I can see it coming. This is a, you tell this stuff so uh, great. Um, but, now, but the thing is, there was some criticism, though, over the sentencing. Oh, of course. Uh, and And that's, an interesting little sidelight. Uh, Joe Freitas was a district attorney. He would come 
uh, to lose the next election because of this verdict. Uh, it had to be one of the squarest, uh, righteous juries I've ever seen. Everybody was like from a, a Rotary Club or an Elks Club, Country Club, not normal juries in San Francisco. But when they were picking this jury, uh, the gay community, uh, the downtrodden community, were all eliminating themselves from being on the jury because they didn't or would not support a death penalty case. Mm. So they eliminated themselves. So we ended up with this extremely square uh, conservative jury, which is, like I say, very strange for San Francisco. That jury returned their verdict of two voluntary manslaughters. And before that verdict came in, I remember like it was yesterday, I'm sitting there with the prosecutor, Tom Norman. Joe Freitas, the district attorney, comes walking in, sits down between us when it's announced that the jury will be coming in. And he doesn't look at his prosecutor. He looks at me. He said, Frank, what's it going to be? What's the verdict going to be? And I said, I think they're going to give the murder of George Moscone a voluntary manslaughter, heat of passion. I said, but when Dan White empties his gun, walks across the other side of the Hall of Justice, I mean, not the Hall of Justice, but City Hall, and he reloads his gun, and he walks in, and he kills Harvey Milk, that's premeditated, that's first-degree murder. And my prosecutor, Tom Norman, got visibly upset with me. He said, Joe, Frank is 100% wrong. I'm guaranteeing you two first-degree murder convictions. And my God, here we are, myself and the prosecutor, two so-called experts, and we're both wrong. The jury returned the two voluntary manslaughters. Dan White was released, I believe it was less than six years Um, what 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 do you make of Harvey Milk? Har- Harvey Milk has been portrayed in the media as some type of a hero, uh, but he was up to some shenanigans with these teenage boys coming to stay at his house. Was that widely known at the time? Oh, well, the gay community is a very powerful group in San Francisco, and at, he had bathhouses. Mm. that were literally houses of prostitution. But because they were men's clubs and they had hot tubs, they could go in and out all day long. And the city at that time was experiencing an upside-down pyramid of AIDS victims that were dying on a daily basis. Thankfully, uh, we were able to convince the mayor, Diane Feinstein, to shut down these gay bathhouses. Um, so, yes, George, uh, uh, he had very liberal leanings. Harvey Milk had very liberal leanings. Uh, can I uh, attest to anything knowledgeably? The answer is no. Okay. But, of course, uh, these bathhouses were nothing more than houses of prostitution. Oh, yeah, we had them in New York, too, and right around the same time. And they were shut down after AIDS as well. And I think we had the same situation. Mayor Koch uh, was the mayor, and there was a lot of uh, um, political pressure to keep the bathhouses open. Uh, we've been speaking of Frank Falzon. Okay, you can find him at frankfalzon.com. Uh, if you want to meet him in person, February 9th, February 8th, February 8th, at the Commonwealth Club at 5.30 p.m., he's going to be doing a PowerPoint presentation. And if it's anything like the presentation you've done here today, Mr. Falzon, I, w- I want to be there myself. Okay, so save me a seat. Uh, the book we're talking about here is San Francisco, Homicide Inspector 5 Henry 7, My Inside Story of the Night Stalkers, City Hall, Murders, Zebra Killings, Chinatown Gang Wars, and City Under Siege. Uh, I'm going to have to beg you to come back, okay? We've got a couple of minutes. We've got about five minutes left. I've got a couple of questions for you. Um, what about the Rodney Akala case, the dating game murder? Did you have anything to do with that? I did not. I, uh, the name is very familiar, but I did not have anything to do with that particular case. Gotcha. Now, uh, what about you? Because we're talking about Satanism. 
with uh, Richard Ramirez. Oh, and up there in San Francisco, you have Anton LaVey and uh, Colonel Michael Aquino. A lot of allegations around uh, the latter. Uh, have you heard anything, any involvement in that? No, I know both names. I never had them on any homicide investigations. Uh, but for your listeners, I want them to know one of the cases that rocks San Francisco more than Zodiac or any of these other cases that we talked about today was the zebra murders. But this was, uh, we believe now, 72 murders in the state of California where blacks were randomly killing whites to start a race war. Uh, we ended up arresting seven uh, black Muslims uh, from the Muslim mosque. Uh, the narrative was played down because of the subject matter. But that case took priority in San Francisco when everything was happening. Patty Hearst, uh, the SLA, the Black Liberation Army, uh, you name it, uh, Zodiac, the Night Stalker. All these things were going down, uh, along with multiple other murder cases. Uh, the best way I can describe it, uh, it, was, it was murder on steroids. And all I can say to your lister, listeners, if they really want to know about San Francisco, go to Frank Falzon, F-A-L-Z-O-N.com. Get the book. And you get an autographed copy, too. If you order it direct from FrankFalzon.com, you get it autographed as well. Uh, absolutely. Um, what about, uh, did you have anything to do with Zodiac? Yeah, the Zodiac case was assigned to me when one investigator that had the case retired and the other one came under some question as to uh, uh, what he was doing with the case and they transferred him out and it was I was called over the chief's office. It became my case, but by that time it was five years old and we believed the Zodiac was either incarcerated or dead. There was no new information that ever came in. And everything that's come in over the years, it's been tested on the handwriting and on the bloody fingerprint that is believed to be the suspects. And there's never been a match. One last quick question for you. Um, back in, the, in those days, in the 70s and even the early 80s, we would have these serial killers uh, like... Um, uh, the, the, not the Zodiac, uh, the, the Night Stalker, and right? they would have these nicknames, right? Uh, why do you think it is we don't see that anymore? I, I think today the narrative has changed drastically with this uh, Black Lives Matter, opening up prison doors, letting everybody out. Uh, police work and, and serious crime work and, and victims seem to be being pushed aside so that uh, the criminal element... Uh, has redemption. Um, some of it obviously is good, a lot of it not so much. Uh, today, uh, uh, police work is, it's, it's, uh, it's sad what's occurring. And it's not only occurring in San Francisco, but throughout the country. Uh, the defunding of the police department, all your major departments being undermanned. Uh, I can't put my finger on it. I just don't respect it or think it's correct. I I thought you're in the 70s and 80s when all hell was breaking loose that we did everything humanly possible to serve the public and do the right job and convict killers for their brutal acts and and sur help surviving victims. I mean, today, I, I got a hearing coming up in a couple of months on a, on a vicious, vicious killer uh, whose family has been tormented, and it goes on now over 50 years. Uh, the tor uh, tormenting uh, of these victims that have the wife has to go back and, and testify again and his brother. It's just so sad that victims never get a relief and all we talk about is redemption for the criminal. Well, Frank, like I said, I'd love to have you come back and we can uh, address these uh, other cases and these other issues you brought up. Uh, FrankFalzone.com You get an autographed book at Frank Fal Falzon. FrankFalzon.com. There's no E at the end. Uh, and then you can meet him in person February 9th, February 8th at the Commonwealth Club at 5.30 p.m. in uh, San Francisco. And once again, the book is called, a uh, very long title, <laughs> it's called San Francisco Homicide Inspector, 
Five Henry Seven, my inside story of the Night Stalker, City Hall murders, zebra killings, Chinatown gang wars, and a city under the siege. Frank, I really enjoyed this. Like I said, you're a great, great narrator telling these stories, and I'd love to have you come back and tell us about the rest of these cases. Well, thank you so much for having me, Ed. It's been a pleasure. Thank you again. Good night. <laughs>